So this is the second week on Good to Great, and we're actually going to go through who, then, what. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Who, then, what. And I just want to spend a few minutes going back through this chart, probably an overview of the chart of the book that I think uh, is good for us to I guess, memorize in a sense, kind of get it into our psyche. Uh, if you look at the top portion, you know, there's this notion of a buildup that happens and then you finally get a breakthrough. <clears throat> and it's really all based on the foundation of what uh, Jim Collins says, or disciplined people with disciplined thought that take disciplined action. So, and underneath that, you have the disciplined people, the level five leadership, which we talked about last week. Then you have, you know, the who, then what, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, confronting the brutal facts, just facing reality. That's part of the disciplined thought. And then the hedgehog concept, which I'm really excited to unpack because that that is a lot of where we want to try to go. And, <clears throat> and then under disciplined action is the culture of discipline. Uh, and then obviously the last portion of that is technology accelerators. So I'd like everybody to say this with me. Uh, I want us to all say at the same time, disciplined people, with disciplined thought, taking discipline action. So you guys ready to do that with me on the yep. count of three? Yep. All right. One, two, three. Disciplined discipline people. people. With discipline thought, thought, taking discipline, discipline action. action. Good job. <laughs> Way to go. All right. So there's this quote from Jim Collins. He says, those who build great companies understand that ultimate throttle on growth for any great company is not markets. Okay, listen to that. Or technology or competition, or products, it is one thing above all others. The ability to get and keep enough of the right people, okay? Hang on to that one. It's really, really important because think about how much you go, well, it's the markets or it's technology, especially nowadays, right? Oh, it's the competition. Oh, it's the products. And according to all of their research, and they did a ton of research, thousands upon thousands of documents that they went through and five years plus of research to really come to this whole thesis of what we're going to be talking through that is just facts, it's data, it's information that shows us that it really comes back to that foundation. So Jim goes through in the book, this concept of the bus, okay? I thought I'd add this fun little bus that maybe one day we'll find something like that. So on the bus, there's these step one, step two, step three, which he says the first starting place, you've got this level five leader, and then you really focus on this getting the right people. So step one is getting right people on the bus. So this, you know, character, competency, and chemistry that you need to really look for to get people on the bus is you have to get the right people on the bus. And then step two is get the wrong people off the bus who shouldn't be, that don't have the character, competency, and chemistry uh, within uh, the company. And then step three is to figure out where to drive it after. Uh, so notice the sequence of that. It's a little backwards. It feels like, well, wait, you got to know where you're going to go first. Then you go get the people. But it's actually not the case according to all the research they did. So think about sports. You'll get your linemen, tailbacks, quarterback, wide receivers, tight end, kicker, right? You're basing everything on great people who want to be around great people. And you know, that's the foundation of building a really good team. And what Jim talks about is that 
they spend more of the time basing it on the people that they're going to be around versus the direction. And the reason why he says that is because if you go in a direction and you need to change, then the foundation was on the wrong thing. The foundation was on the, going this specific direction as opposed to the people uh, that you're around. Uh, also, if you have the right people, you don't have to worry about motivation and management. They are already internally motivated. They have a great vision and without great people, it's irrelevant, essentially. So he, that's part of his thesis. Now, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to play with a coach who was Coach Gelwick's. And he coached for 35 years. And I was just looking at his track record uh, this week. He had 419 wins, 10 losses, and 20 out of 25 national championships. So it means he went to the national championships 25 times and won 20 out of the 25. Now, <clears throat> one of the things he did that I didn't really understand at the time is I, I'm going through this now and I was like, wow is he spent most of the time just getting the right people on the bus. And the way he did it at the beginning of the season was everybody came out in this tryout and it was, it was like a two week tryout that everybody had to go through. And it was just brutal. It was grueling. You were running. Um, and so he was legitimately trying to weed people out. I mean, cause he really wanted to make sure whoever was on was not only committed to do what they needed to do, physically so working hard but they also had to show that they had bought into the culture and he had a very very intentional culture that he was trying to develop i mean i could rattle off so many statements that he used to you know say to us all the time i mean he just pounded that in our heads all the time about the culture that he was trying to create and, uh, and it really became the foundation for the success was the culture that he had and the people within that culture to develop this dynasty that, you know, I don't think he started off that way. I just think he started doing it. And all of a sudden he realized, oh, this is the formula. I have to get the right people on the bus. And that's the way he did it. And a lot of people dropped out. A lot of people quit. Uh, for the people that stayed, it was just a real blessing to be able to work under somebody like him. And I would consider him a level five leader for sure. So what are what are the main things we look for in hiring? And what he talks about in the book is, is number one, character. And then number two is work ethic. Uh, so I want to ask you guys, when you think about character, what types of character traits do you think that we're looking for? I'd love to just hear from some of you guys about that. Humble, hungry, and smart. Ah, good job. I like it. Humble, hungry, and smart. That's good. Anybody else? More specifically on the smart, you know, like be smart relationally. Um, so I think, you know, we're just definitely looking for people who can, you know, talk to different kinds of people and just, you know, um, be really smart in social environments. Yeah, that's great. Love that. Yeah. Relationally smart. And on the side of things with being hungry, um, really being a self-starter and like taking a lot of initiative and a lot of accountability for their own actions and being willing to put in all of the work that it takes to get to um, a successful position. Yeah, absolutely. Being willing to do what it takes to get where you need to go, 100%. Great job. And I think a little bit more to add on to what I just said about relationality, like just being able to like they know how to build relationship, right? So whether that's on a team, we're building relationship with our team members. So we're going to be a great team player. And then also relationship with our clients, making them feel safe and trusted and all these things. Yeah, that's great. Love that. Yeah, I was, I, I made a couple of things, collaborative, flexible, 
confident, integrity, takes initiative, resourceful, tenacious, disciplined. So just some of the things that kind of had jotted down. Um, but, you know, to do, do what it takes to accomplish what is needed. So it's good, good to, uh, good to just sort of walk through this, but those were the two things you said, look, you're hiring really based on character and work ethic, but that was really interesting. So he says, you know, so I, I made this comment, you know, you need vision, mission, and strategy first, right? And, uh, his response to that is no. And, and I'll walk you through a Fannie Mae example. So, so David Maxwell was the CEO of Fannie Mae in, in 1981. And at that time, the company was losing, now listen to this, $1 million every day. Okay. So... They had 56 billion worth of mortgage loans and they were all underwater. So you can imagine like the desperation <laughs> of the board. They're just like, what the heck are we gonna do? So the board desperately wanted to know like what Maxwell was gonna do to rescue the company. And Maxwell responded to the what question the same way that all the good to great leaders do. He said, that's the wrong first question. He said, to decide where to drive the bus before you have the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus is absolutely the wrong approach. So Maxwell told the management team, there would only be seats on the bus for A-level people who are willing to put out A-plus effort. So he interviewed every member of the team and he told them all the same thing. He said, it's going to be a really tough ride, very demanding trip. And if they didn't want to go, it's fine. Just say so. And now, <clears throat> now's the time to get off the bus, he said. No questions asked, no recriminations. And all 14 of the 26 executives got off the bus. And they were replaced by some of the best, smartest, and the hardest working executives in the work place of finance. <clears throat> and so with the right people on the bus and the right seats, Maxwell then turned his full attention to the what question with the team, right? And he and his team took Fannie Mae from losing $1 million a day at the start of the tenure to earning more than $4 million a day at the end, okay? Even after Maxwell left in 1991, the great team continued to drive the flywheel, as you'll learn about later, um, upon turn, upon turn, upon turn. So Fannie Mae uh, generated cumulative stock returns nearly eight times better than the general market from 1984 to 1999 without strategy. So just to kind of give you an idea of how this works in real life. Uh, let's talk about Wells Fargo for a minute. So Wells Fargo began its 15 year stint of spectacular performance in night so it was 1983 so the foundation of the shift dates back to probably the 1970s the ceo was dick uh, dick cooley and he began building one of the most talented uh, management teams uh, according to warren buffett it was it was the best like literally the best team so cooley foresaw that the banking industry would eventually undergo wrenching change but he didn't pretend to know what that would even be. So he he didn't really know. And so he didn't even map out a strategy for change at all. And him and the chairman, Ernie Arbuckle, uh, focused on just injecting an endless stream of talent. That was kind of the phrase they use directly into the veins of, of them. And honestly, without even any specific job in mind, uh, he says, that's how you build the future. He said, I, if I'm not smart enough to see the changes that are coming, they will and they'll be flexible enough to deal with them. And so Wells Fargo at that time with really tumultuous uh, times outperformed the market by three, three X. And, um, and then when Wells Fargo acquired Crocker, uh, let go of 1600 managers since they were not the right fit of the culture of Wells. And he just goes on to say, letting the wrong people hang around is unfair to all the right people as they are inevitably find themselves compensating for the inadequacies of the wrong people. 
So it kind of gives this this case study of like the same thing, like Wells getting the right people on the bus. And there's a few, uh, I guess, elements to this just to, to think through. Uh, they call a genius with a thousand followers, uh, which is, is a concept that a lot of companies that were not good to great did. And so unlike good to great companies, the comparison companies follow what's called the genius with a thousand helpers, they called it model in this model there was really one strong extraordinary individual leading the company and the other people who help him implement his ideas the problem is when the genius leaves or dies those helpers are left alone right they don't have a clue of what they're supposed to do and so um so that's sort of the um you know contrast i guess and then um Compensation for the right people only. He says a curious finding was that the compensation in the good to great companies was not to get the right behavior of the wrong people, but to keep the right people on the bus. So Nucor, a steel product company, paid its workers more than any other company in the world, but over 50% of the compensation was tied to the productivity of the team a worker was on. So as a result, people would come to work 30 minutes earlier and in one extreme case, teammates chased a lazy colleague out of the plant with an angle iron. I don't think that probably goes over HR principles, but you get the point. Uh, and then three practical decisions that he leaves here is when in doubt, don't hire and keep looking, right? Don't just don't hire for the sake of, of hiring. Number two is when you know you need to make a change, act, just do it. And then number three was put your best people on the biggest opportunities, not the biggest problems, essentially. So there's what kind of the principles of um, this whole notion of who versus what. So my questions to you guys, I guess in closing, is, you know, what do you think about this, the bus principle? Like what, you know, is your general overarching thought process number two was what was a paradigm shift for you and why possibly and then uh what do you think this is why do you think this is a concept that makes sense or not maybe you say i don't think it makes any sense um so i'd love to open the floor with um those questions